Yeah. Hello, everyone. We are back at Roots and Sing. This is the edition 222. We had the last one on webinars and it was all online. We are happy that this year is going to happen in person. We also have a few webinars that everybody can join from the Nordic countries. Uh, we're going to meet 28th and 29th of September in the city of Aalborg. Uh, we wait for all of you interested in composing music for sync or synchronization, your own compositions, to come and join and learn from experts who work with series like Vikings, The Kingdom, video games, and other synchronization events. So yeah, for starting, we have a panel or a artist inspiration talk, how we would like it to go. We have uh, Torben, who's going to be the interviewer. He's uh, the chef of uh, Tempe. Um, Rune, who is a fiddle player at Dreamer Circus, and Tom Sherlock, who is the manager of Dreamer Circus. So I'm going to pass the word to Torben, and I think I'm going to disappear from the screen. I hope everybody enjoys this webinar. Well, thank you, Laia. And uh, I think my formal title is General Manager of Tempe. Uh, and Tempe is a, a genre organization, that's the title. And we work with uh, folk music and world music in Denmark. And among other things, we, we do internationalization. We work with artists uh, touring abroad, but also trying to sell their music other ways abroad. And synchronization, is one of those and it's interesting because uh, everything is kind of exploding at the moment with streaming services i have four of them myself at the moment maybe that's too much uh, so there are a lot of moving pictures and synchronization as i as far as i understand is about putting music under these moving pictures and roots and sync is about putting specifically folk music or traditional music or roots music under moving pictures and of course that's uh, something that's in demand sometimes and um, as Laia said, we have two uh, very special guests, and I'm very honored to have you two guys on my screen. We can do it in person another day, perhaps. And um, I'm going to interview you about this area, how how you got started, and how others maybe can get started, and how the process is when you when you work with music uh, for living, moving pictures. And um, Rune, I'd like to start with you. You're a violinist and a songwriter, composer in Dreamer Circus, uh, but also do other projects. When was your first, when was the first time you worked in this area that you made music for uh, moving pictures? Yeah, well, thank, thank you for the invitation, first of all. Um, happy to be here. Uh, so my first experience with this was actually somewhat of a coincidence. Um, I play in a string quartet also, the Danish string quartet, and back in 2014, we recorded an album of traditional, mainly traditional Nordic folk music in our own arrangements, uh, an album called Woodworks. And um, it lived sort of its own, own life uh, online and physical copies, obviously. Um, and then one day I was approached by an editor who was working on a movie called Frosten Before the Frost, which was a Nordic film production. And uh, he just wrote me on Messenger, actually, uh, saying, you know, we're working on this film and we've been listening a little bit uh, on your album and thought it, it might uh, be a good match with this movie. And uh, it was actually my wife who, who knew the people who, who wrote me. And he, she said, well, you need to answer those people. I mean, they, it, you know, they, they are good people. It's good names. And she used to work a little bit in the film industry. So I, I answered back and said, that sounds interesting. And um, um, then we, we had a meeting. Uh, I went to Nordic Film Studios and then we had a, a, a great meeting and decided to move forward on this. Um, so I didn't do much actually myself uh, to get into this world. Uh, it was actually a coincidence. Um, just having our music out there led to them hearing it and uh, they thought it would it would be a good match. Um, 
it's quite a simple album. It's just a string quartet playing tunes. And uh, the movie is also, it's, it's, it's a historical drama uh, set in the, um, on a farm in the, in the 19th century um, with a lot of close-up images and, and, and stuff like that. So just those four uh, stringed instruments fitted very nicely uh, as a score to, to this movie. And then after that, I've been working also with Dreamer Circus and, and in other uh, constellations with a few other projects um, that actually some of them uh, came out of my my first uh, production with with Nordic Film. So one thing led to the other. Um, yeah. So it's it's important to to check your messenger once in a while. That's the first lesson. <laughs> 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 and the, the music you wrote for for Far Frosten was um, you composed it yourself, or was it some of the uh, recordings you did? Was you you made it yourself? Yeah, most of it. We also uh, re-recorded some of the tracks from Woodworks, or one of the tracks at least. But the rest of the material was uh, was uh, new composed material. Um, yeah, uh, for the movie. And how how does it work when you? When you write original music for a movie, just you just go home and write stuff, or do they have demands and specifications and stuff? I actually have a, a funny story uh, about that because um, this was it, this was my first attempt on writing score music, and uh, I had no idea how to do that and how to you know work in a process like that. So we're really learning by doing. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I went home, uh, watched some of the the footage, um, some of some of the recordings they did, uh, trying to find inspiration, all these things. And uh, I wrote uh, a lot of different cues so they could listen. Went out again to the studio. We went through all the material that I did, all the ideas I had, and um, they were like, mm, "Well, it's it's okay, but." Okay, here's here's one idea. And then the editor said to me, tonight you go home, you open a bottle of good cognac, and then you just put your mic like on, start recording, and then just try to improvise something. Okay, so uh, so that's what I did. The same night I went home, I, I had a bottle of, of cognac, had a little sip, and then um, just started recording with my with my instrument. And then, you know, I ended up with like a 15, 20 minutes of just like ideas that came to mind during that moment in the evening. And a lot of it actually ended up in the final movie. Um, so that was one way of doing it. Uh, and I think maybe what they were searching for is music that was not overly, you know, analytical or thought through, but just something that, you know, was was an immediate inspiration. Um, so so that was that was one way of doing it, and then it worked out quite nice for that movie actually. Um, but then again, every project is different, every director is different, so so it also varies depending on the project, obviously. And when well, I'm curious, when did you actually get to see some of the pictures? When did you start? Because it sounds like you didn't see anything at that point. You just improvised. But I suppose that at some point you got to see the pictures and got a feeling about what you were writing music for. Yeah, well, actually, in, in all the things I've been involved in, with the exception of one project with Dreamer Circus, but but in all other projects, I've actually um, been invited on quite late in the process, which means that they were already uh, shooting at the moment. So I actually got to see some of the uh, the pictures they did already, which is a huge inspiration. I I find. I mean, I'm not used to reading scripts um, and you know making my own imagination about how that movie is going to be. I'm myself a very uh, visual person. I get a lot of inspiration from watching something um, unfold on a screen. Um, some some pictures, seeing the faces and all that is 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 really a big help to me. So so um, and that was also the case with this first movie. So so I actually got to see some of the the, the it was not f finished, it was not edited completely at all, but but just to get a sense of the set and and you know the temperature, the flavor of of the pictures is is a big help to me personally. 
And uh, besides from doing movies, uh, you've done some computer games. Is that correct? Video games. Yeah, we uh, we, uh, we did one little project with Dreamer Circus uh, with a with a Danish independent uh, computer game uh, company, uh, um, and it was for a, a game called Felix the Reaper, uh, which is actually a wonderful uh, little game. Um, and uh, it was also very new to us and also to them uh, they it was it was a completely new way of, of thinking music for a computer game because they did this which was actually a, a software program that uh interacted with the game in a way that every time you did something correct in the game so it was sort of a puzzle game the music would intensify and that you cannot really pre-record you need some sort of algorithm to help you with that so what we did was that we recorded all these loops that an algorithm actually uh, um, sort of put together with some uh, data or criteria from us how the algorithm should do that. But we never really knew the the what the the player would hear. Um, but that was like really great experience for us and and. Uh, very um we learned a lot from that i would say sounds very fun and uh tom you're getting anxious i can see <laughs> uh, I, it was easy to introduce rune because everyone knows what a musician is and and uh, a lot of people know dreamer circus and the danish string quartet but maybe we need a, a little more thorough introduction of you what what do you do um i'm an artist manager and a, a consultant in and around the exploitation and use of folk music and traditional music. Uh, and I'm very lucky to, uh, for the last eight, nine, ten years, have worked closely with Dreamer Circus uh, as their manager. And recently I've been helping uh, the Danish String Quartet with some clearances also. So that's basically what I do. And what's your experience uh, as an artist manager of, of synchronization? Yeah. Um, I, previous to working independently as an artist manager, I worked with a record company and publisher in Ireland. Uh, and the label I worked with was one of the more, well, perhaps the biggest uh, folk and traditional music label working in Ireland. And through the 70s, 80s, uh, into the 90s, folk music from Ireland was actually very big. and. Uh, brand and genre of Celtic music took off. And I was in and around that. And I can point to many movies that, and uh, television series that looked for clearances and synchronization pieces. And I was lucky enough to be working with a very uh, high profile Irish band called The Chieftains. And they're perhaps the most famous folk music band in the world. and. Their music was in high demand uh, in movies and sometimes the uh, rather than commission the band themselves or the band were too busy to take on new commissions uh, 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 movie producers would be looking for clearance on on some of the music so i gained some experience in clearing that and, you know in negotiating fees and rights and terms for it uh, right back in from the mid 80s onwards uh, and a number of Hollywood projects and more local, some Irish movies and then some TV television series uh, and just sitting in on negotiations and seeing how, you know, producers and national television stations, for example, would what they were prepared to pay, how they paid what rights and clear uses they want. Some of them wanted to own their music forever and in, you know, in whatever format and others you'd be seeking to restrain and say, well, that's fine once it's synced to this particular movie or television series. So uh, I was very fortunate in having that background in, in the label and the associated publishing house within the label. And, and uh, Yes. Yeah, I, I just I guess there's a good point here to be made that that's why uh, there's two of you in this interview because 
artists may be contacted by by movie people uh, but there's so much technical stuff so many rights that need to be cleared and so much so many negotiations about money and stuff so yeah. it often takes someone like you in the background perhaps. and and yeah. more and yeah. more and a lawyer or mm -hmm. a, a sync specialist so for example uh Runa and I and Dreamers, uh, we we work with a specialist uh, uh, person also in this regard because I have some experience, but there's a German colleague who we work with who has vast experience in this area. So that's we find that useful uh, as a guide and uh, uh, as sometimes as an introduction to to you know more work or other areas of work and uh, uh, just as general supportive and then if it's very large scale you may well need a lawyer but you know, you, a, a music, music business lawyer a specialist lawyer yeah and i think we'll probably get into some of that stuff at the seminar but i'm interested in hearing the the all the examples you've given so far have been just people contacting you because you've been uh, making interesting music or working with famous bands as you said tom but how does it work when you, if if you're in the other situation that you aren't just contacted, but you want to work with Sync, how, how can you sell your music um, to to movies or commercials or whatever? Do you have experience in that field, Tom? Um, Torben, I'm afraid I missed the very start of your question because of the sound dropout. So my apologies. Could you repeat it? Yeah, I just asked if you if you aren't contacted, if you aren't lucky enough that that a movie editor writes you on Messenger, how do you start working with it? How do you how do you sell your music to movie producers, for instance? Um, I honestly, my experience is that it's almost impossible to do that. You may. For example, you may have a publishing deal with a publishing company and they will have a relationship with uh, sync uh, uh, agents. And really, you're hoping there that the, they, the publishers and the sync people will utilize their own pre-existing networks to pitch your music to... to uh, advertising companies for ads or to television production or to movie makers and that sometimes happens but i've not consciously gone you know trying to bombard mgm studios <laughs> universal or whatever with uh oh please you gotta listen to my new act you've got to listen to this no uh, my experience shows just like runas that Actually, I shouldn't say this too publicly, but but I'm somewhat skeptical of. I, I know they have a role and a part, and I don't wish to 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 be be rude about anybody's profession. But uh, sync agents uh, sometimes, of course, they 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 serve a function. But my experience shows that where things happen, it's because. Uh, either the producer or very often the director, who's the primary artistic drive behind a project, says, I want this. Uh, or the director will seek expert advice. And usually they prefer independence. So they don't want to talk to publishers or sing people. They want to talk to people who know. And they can find that because they're creative, artistic people. And very often I find myself in discussions then with people who say, talk to that guy. He knows about songs from the 18th century, or he knows about Irish music over this period of time, or you know, and you get asked, and and I've always enjoyed that aspect of it. And then you can point out to them and say, Well, perhaps what you're looking for is this. So I mean. But it sounds like uh, that as soon as Rune did his first job, it started a chain of events and he got more jobs. So it's like, I guess yeah. that's that first. Uh, success order. breeds success. Success breeds success. Uh, and, and reputation helps because somebody then will turn around and say, oh yeah, that was good. I enjoyed that. Or for example, when the Titanic movie came out, 
with Brad Pitt and uh, no Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kate yeah. Winslet. Yeah, yeah. The music, the theme song by Celine Dion, featured an intro played on the low whistle, which is used extensively in Irish music, and because. I'd already established a reputation as ask that guy about Irish music. He works with these, these, and these. Don't go to the publishers because they'll only give you what they want to give you. I, at the time, I was also running a record store in Ireland, which was special, uh, specialized in world and folk and traditional music. So, and uh, Dublin was cool at the time. There were a lot of creatives living there because of tax breaks and, and lots of rock stars and different types of musicians. And uh, Riverdance had taken off and you two were recording in the same building as I was in. And uh, so you got, you got that cool factor and people would reach out. So they all wanted a low whistle on their on their movies. And so even the Lord of the Rings movie, you know, people say, where can we get that? Well, this guy is living in New Zealand, actually, and he plays the Irish flute. You should talk to him. Mm. So he got the gig. <laughs> um, but they right. also commissioned any of them to write a piece for it, you know, and I had no part in that. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess what, what's interesting about doing this seminar, besides from, from helping out aspiring composers to work in this field, is that I feel that very often when there are movies and TV shows and they they touch upon they or they they take place in scenarios um, that have some kind of historical context or uh, Viking settings and stuff, they mm. use the wrong music. They hire the wrong people that don't know anything about this, and I'm just kind of sad because I work in this field and know so many good composers. I'm sad that they don't know these people. They don't reach out to the right yeah. composers that can help them write the right music. It would make a a big difference in the movies and i'm not going to mention any examples because it might make me unpopular i think that's the problem i would love to have uh, more of Wuna's kind composing music for uh, everything mm. and it will happen it will happen but you know people sometimes uh the movie and the creative business right across the board can be a little lazy can resort to stereotype or resort to uh, that worked for that you know like the example i gave with titanic uh, but the, the best low whistle player in Ireland was kept busy for months in studios, <laughs> I mean, you know, and he was the go-to guy. Mm. Uh, and uh, a, But you're quite right. I mean, authenticity, I think, is important for me, but not for everybody. I mean, some people don't care. I'll give you an important example, and it predates my time in that record company, but it was the same band, The Cheetahs. Their music was used in a great movie by the wonderful director Stanley Kubrick, and it's called Barry Lyndon. Mm. And it's one of his better movies, but it's very arty and, and you know, wonderful movie. The music used in that is, you know, really well chosen and it's traditional Irish music in the main because the movie is set in, in Ireland at, at, at the period and some classical music also but the the impact and the international effect that that had was phenomenal that created an international market for this music and it was the chieftains became identified with that and immediately they got asked to do more for the work as a result of this and the label I know could not keep up with the volume, the demand for, for vinyl all over the world. And they, we had to license it to, to at the time, Polydor Records, and, uh, who were big. And uh, so the impact that music in a movie can have can be enormous and can be life-changing for, for artists in some cases. So are you saying this because you have the answer to how we make going to make that happen in Denmark or are just teasing us with a good story that's out of no, reach? No, I, uh, Runa and I and uh, all people in Dreamer Circus are actually actively trying to bring that about. But we we would, I think Runa and I'm right in saying, we put our hands up and saying, we don't quite know how we make it happen, but... Well, the, the example I gave you, because of the success of the Barry Lyndon movie, other uh, 
uh, other producers and directors wanted similar or similar type music. Mm. And the more you work in this area, the more work you get. So for Runa, you can talk perhaps about how we got approached by Dior to, to write, not just uh, to write soundtrack and live music for what was to be their biggest television uh, television investment. Uh, and that happened because we gradually pushed our profile up, proven that across the band members, they can all write and compose. And, and particularly with you, your previous experience, and I think that helped considerably. But again, it was, I think it's fair to say, it was director led. Yes, exactly. So, so, uh, and if I can add just a point, I guess also, um, it's sometimes tricky, as Tom say, to to find out how you enter that world. So, I guess just a general advice would would be to really um, find your own sound, uh, try to do something that hasn't been done before, maybe. And don't try to um, make something that you think others will like or that you think something something will fit into a movie, but something that you trust in yourself and that you really like yourself. Um, that 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 would be at least my my advice. And then, I mean, uh, things can happen, and and someday you might get a. a you know, message, message uh, somewhere, you know, and uh, one thing can lead to the other. Um, one other thing uh, that that was just talking about process that I figured out is that uh, many people might be experienced in writing music for a stage and and the difference probably couldn't be much bigger uh, when you're writing for a movie. Um, just in terms of how the slow the music often is, you know, when at least when writing background scores, uh, that was really a revelation for me. Uh, because when writing music for a stage, you want to tell the whole story with the music, and obviously you can't do that because the images, the acting, all that, already says so much. Um, so that was like an important uh, experience to me uh, uh, that you should think all your music sort of twice as long as you would normally do for a stage. Um, but I'm sure you'll get into that probably also in a, in a seminar maybe. Yeah. And uh, Rune was uh, giving advice for aspiring composers. Tom, do you have any, if, if you're sitting at home and you, you believe you're a really good composer and you work in this area of rules music, what should you do? How, how should you, uh, how to get started? I think what creative people look for is identity. And it's not always a good idea to think you're going to be better than Hans Zimmer or John Williams. You know, they're really good at what they do. And it's great if your ambition and talent extends to matching or being better than that. Wonderful, go for it. But really, there's plenty of people out there doing this to a very high level. Of course you can and should aspire to it if that's your thing. But a little like Runa says, identity and belief and trust in your own art and the, the, the value of it and the, the authenticity of it. And then it will be heard. So being a third rate John Williams clone isn't, you know, not really gonna, you know, what are you doing? You just, hey, maybe there's work there as well, but I don't know. But to make a real difference and to be true to yourself as an artist, seek for what's authentic and what it is that you're about and what your sound is, and then show yourself as a composer. You know, but what will immediately attract people is that I like this. It's authentic. It's it's the woodworks recording opened the door for you, Runa. Uh, and I can completely understand being, understand that because when you listen to that recording, you're going, "This is different. I haven't heard this before. I know these tunes, but I haven't heard this level of arrangement and." you know, fantastic uh, skill and performance, but it's not, 
it's not folk music. <laughs> it's it's wonderfully played folk tunes, but they're interpreted in a way that they the string Danish string quartet don't pretend to be anything other than what they are, which is an excellent, excellent world class string quartet interpreting music that you and perhaps some of the other guys are in it have a direct and personal relationship with. And that becomes interesting. And but frankly, I, I'm much more interested in hearing that level of expression, and I mean this respectfully, than if you playing Brahms or, or Beethoven, even though you do it excellently. Yeah. But what, what this, this is, it's the quirkiness, it's the point of interest, it's that intersection where the creative brain would say, hey, this is good. <laughs> I guess that's the that's what movies are about. Even if they take place uh, in yeah. the past, it's not an exact recreation of what actually happened. It's a modern uh, representation of what happened, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and I, th that's actually what Dreamer Circus and the String Quartz it does so excellently. It takes yeah. the best from the past. Yeah. And, Mo yeah. Movies are artifice, and so is music making. Exactly. Although when it when it comes across as natural and natural, that's when the that's when it becomes magical. <laughs> Uh, I'll allow myself to make an, an ending remark because I think something that, that's important in this, it, I, and I agree it's not necessarily easy to sell your, yourself as a composer for music, but what we can do and what we're trying to do with this concept, Roots and Sync, is position ourselves and tell the outside world that there are so much, so many good composers, so much quality and so much quirkiness and so much um, uh, revitalization in this area that they should be aware of us and they should know and they should call us if they need something and also the other way around that we should tell all the composers that that of course they have a place in the professional in the in the money business and of course anyone if they're a good and interesting composer can be part of this and make music for all kinds of things movies and computer games and whatever they want so this is just about gaining knowledge and building bridges to, to that part of the world uh, and that's what I'm I'm hearing you guys saying in a, a project that you're a big part of. So um, thank you for your time. Very interesting. I know you have a lot of other stories about this, but we'll save them for another time because we're going to meet and talk about this a lot. Uh, but thank you for being here and um, see you soon. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Corbin. Everything. Bye.